Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here uh, at Queen's Park. Um, as a young man, 40 years ago, I worked in this building uh, for uh, the deputy premier at the time, Bob Welch. Uh, and my dad was a, a, a member and a minister, and I'm going to see his name uh, upstairs. Ms. Barnes, how are you? MPP from Ajax, thank you for coming. Um, Karen and I are going to be here for question period uh, later today, and uh, the minister reminds me that it's, that it's uh, question period, not answer period. So, um, so we're delighted to be here. Listen, mental health is something we all have to talk about. Uh, mental and Lauren Cole, my good friend from uh, Whitby, is here as well. Mental health doesn't care if you're black or white. Mental health doesn't care if you're gay. Or straight. Mental health doesn't care if you're a man or a woman. Mental health doesn't care if you're rich or poor. Mental health doesn't care if you're French or English. Um, and mental health doesn't care if you're a conservative or even a liberal. Um, it affects us all. And uh, I think it's important that as we gather here in the seat of government, that we can begin a dialogue about the importance uh, of mental health and to continue the conversation. Alex is uh, my stepson, Karen's son. Alex died by suicide on April 1st, Easter Sunday, uh, 2018. And uh, Karen and I, from that very day, uh, decided um, that we would honor Alex's name by being open about the circumstances of his uh, passing. So we continue to be his voice in terms of the discussion about mental health. And it's so important that we have an opportunity to talk about mental health. You'll see the pictures of Alex and um, he's not the face of mental health. This is a guy that was 27 life of the party, a good-looking young man, just engaged on his life journey. Um, but mental health didn't know that. Mental health affected him uh, to the point where he thought that he wasn't loved or it'd be better without him, and uh, that makes no rational sense. So people with mental health challenges uh, are in a troubled spot in their life. So I think it's important that we reach out to those in need. We reach out to a friend that you haven't heard from a, from a couple days or a couple months or a couple years. Um, it's so amazing that what can happen by offering to have a coffee with someone or just picking up the phone or even sending them a text. This is the new way of connecting, is sending them a text. And we got to bring down the barriers and the stigma about mental health. As I say, uh, we're quite proud to say that uh, dad is battling cancer, but we don't have the same comfort level in saying dad is battling depression or addiction or schizophrenia. So we just have to bring the barriers down. And I see my friend Mike here, Shoram, who was at the Premier's Award last night. Um, congratulations on your nomination. This is a guy that has overcome mental health um, and depression. I heard his story last week at one of the Alex Monaghan mental health chats. This is a gentleman that did a world-class endeavor. He crossed all the Great Lakes on a paddle boat. I couldn't do it on a royal boat, Michael, so good for you. And uh, what you did, uh, paddling during the night uh, and he talked uh, last week about the sun sh coming up. I remember what you were saying about uh, we paddled at night and then the sun was coming up and it brought new life, new energy, a new day and uh, I think our conversations about mental health have to bring a new day, a new path, a, a, new, a new feeling. So thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, Lauren Coe, there's breakfast here for 50 people so I <laughs> Um, I know you'll I, I know you'll enjoy some breakfast, but 
thank you all for being here. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for the community groups that have uh, come. Thank you, Karen, for um, agreeing to do the Alex Monahan Mental Health Chats. The Mayor's Gala was, uh, all of the proceeds of the gala this year went to mental health. The um, ACT team uh, at Lake Ridge, uh, to Wounded Warriors, um, uh, which is head off this in the, the Great Riding of Whitby, uh, as well as the Royal Canadian Legions in Pickering and Claremont, as well as the Carrion Fen Foundation. So thank you all for being here today. It means a lot that you uh, uh, journey down to Queen's Park uh, so, so early in the morning. Um, but enjoy your breakfast, enjoy your conversation, and uh, uh, remember his name. So thank you. God bless. My name is... Um Dr. Joel Anieri Abo I'm a pediatrician from Durham. I have an office, a community pediatric office in Durham, in the city of Wimpy, in downtown Wimpy. Um, I have um, the privilege of being here today by invitation of Ms. Karen Friend because of the fact that we have engaged over the last several years in some of the work that I do as a pediatrician. My practice is largely focused on children with various non-communicable diseases. So autism, ADHD. I'll say 90% of my practice is about ADHD and autism. And every day I'm diagnosing a new ch another child with autism or ADHD. Um, kids who have anxiety, depression, so many years ago, it used to be the practice that psychiatrists handled mental health issues. But there aren't enough pediatric psychiatrists in Ontario, in Canada, or in Durham. And over time, a lot of, a lot of community pediatricians are faced with patients who are in distress. A nine-year-old comes who is anxious, who is depressed, and we are you know, front line, in addition to the family doctors. Now, uh, because family doctors have a huge population of patients, they would very often, most of them are not comfortable dealing with kids with mental health, so the pediatricians get all of that. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, there is a huge, there's a huge gap in the, services we can provide in the sense that as a pediatrician I can make my diagnosis, I can say this is what is going on and I can start um, medication treatment. But studies in, in pediatric world show that when it comes to mental health in children, so anxiety, depression, unlike in adults, medication is not the first line. It's really counseling. It's cognitive behavior therapy. It is support, family support, and you know, re reorienting the child's brain. You know, I imagine at age seven, about six to seven is when a child can actually begin to appreciate the, the tenets of cognitive behavior therapy. If I see a child who's for who's got OCD, for instance, and I have them in my practice, three-year-old OCD or tic disorders or Tourette's, they can't access cognitive behavior therapy at that age. So what do we do? For even those who can access cognitive behavior therapy, there's a there's a huge there's a huge. No, it's it's working. <laughs> so there's just the cord got pulled out. All right. Yes. Thank you. Hello. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll move back a bit. So for even those who are old enough to benefit from psychological counseling, cognitive behavior therapy, there is the barrier of cost. I serve a population that is not indigent, but as everyone is aware, disp disposable income is very, very hard to come by. And so I'll have children in my, in my practice whose parents might have some form of insurance that says, well, we can give you two sessions of um, CBT. I won't do anything for the child, right? Or we can give you three sessions. 
anxiety, depression, childhood anxiety, childhood depression is a lifelong condition. These are lifelong conditions. They don't end when the child turns 18. They don't end when the child goes to high school or goes to university. They get carried on. And because children often find it difficult to articulate their feelings and their thoughts, a lot of childhood mental health disorders go undiagnosed and untreated. In my practice, I currently have a wait list of about, of about four to six months. That is frightening. And even after I see the kids and I make a diagnosis, to access the services they need. So if I say go to a psychologist, there's no money for psychology. There are fantastic resources in Durham. I'm a proud um, resident of Durham. I've been living there for about nine years. It's a great place to be. There are great community services, you know, KNAC, the Durham CHC, services, and, and um, we also have Grandview. And Lake Ridge itself has a good mental health program. A small one for, for pediatrics, a huge one for adults. But to access those services is a huge wait list, even the, the community one. To get into KINAC, I have kids in my practice who have been waiting for months. Because we just don't have enough mental health professionals who can support the children and their families and the parents. When mental health affects one individual, it doesn't just affect that child. I keep saying child because I'm a pediatrician. It doesn't just affect the child, it affects the family, it affects the, 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 the siblings, the grandparents, everybody is impacted. Now, from the, from the kids I see, in my practice day in, day out. It is evident that the sooner they can access the help they need, the better the outcome. One of the other things that happens is because of the limitation in access to appropriate mental health support and counseling, kids end up in emergency departments where they shouldn't be. And emergency departments, as we all know across Ontario, is full and overflowing at the same with acutely ill, physically ill people, right? And so going to emergency department for a mental health, unless, not unless it's a suicidal, um, acute suicidal attempt, is not a good way of using the, the services of, of, or the health resources. The other thing I want to say is that in addition to my private practice, I also work in the hospital. And I will say to you that every day, every two days, we have a child who's attempted suicide by taking overdose of various things, Tylenol, their mental health, um, you know, Prozac, all of that. And so, in standing here today, I want to help them, to help in raising the awareness that mental health challenges and difficulties cut across every age group, every social class, like Mia Asha said, and every race, every political leaning. It's no respect of persons. Now there's a moral dilemma for me as a pediatrician, as a clinician, who sees kids, makes a diagnosis, but I don't have the resources, I don't have the training to provide psychological support. And I try and see them as often as possible. Sometimes I'll see kids every week just to provide that point of contact. So I'll tell a story. I have a young man who is now maybe 14, 15. Started seeing him when he was about eight. He would not go to school. For a whole school year, he could not go out of his house to school because of crippling anxiety and crippling depression. Over the years, with 
some counseling services and medication treatment. He is now engaged in sports. He is now going to school full time. Still comes to my office about every one to two months. Just that point of contact. I'm going to close by saying that for each one of us, unless we speak out, we don't know what the other person is going through. And we all look very normal on the outside. But on the inside, there's a lot of struggle for most people. For most people. Everybody has some degree of mental health distress. The key thing is how we cope and what supports we have in place. And whether the person who is affected is bold enough or brave enough to be open to their closest family members to say, I'm going through this. And in this fast-paced world that we live in today, we do tend to get carried away with you know, what is right in front of us. Childhood anxiety is on an epidemic scale. Since after the pandemic, the number of patients that I personally see has more than doubled. And I know that for my colleagues in Durham, across the community, all my community pediatric, pediatric colleagues, we're seeing the same thing. We've got huge wait, wait lists. We've got, you know, huge numbers of kids who need to access CBT, who need a social worker to be able to connect with them. And my, my, my cry today is for the powers that be to see how we can leverage all these community organizations to make these resources closer to home for our children. I thank you for the opportunity to speak and I look forward to chatting with everyone later. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Ani. As it was mentioned, my name is France Gelina. I'm the MPP for Nickel Belt, which is a great big riding in northeastern Ontario. And for the last 16 years, I have been the health critic for my party, the NDP. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome the mayor of Pickering and his wife uh, to Queen's Park and welcome all of you. As I've just mentioned, I have been here for 16 years. We have never had a mental health chat at Queen's Park, ever. You are the first one to bring this to Queen's Park, but I cannot tell you how important it is to have this event, to have this event now and to have this event at Queen's Park. Uh, a good doctor uh, knows uh, mental health way more than I ever will. But what I can tell you is that as an MPP, I would say at least twice a month, a family will come to my office because they have a child who has mental health issues and they are put on a wait list. In my neck of the woods, it's about 18 months before you get to see someone. In that 18 months, the family falls apart. They want to help their child. They don't know what to do. The mom thinks we should do this. The dad thinks he should do that. And then conflicts arise. The child gets worse. And then he can't attend or she can't attend school. And it's just awful. And then they come in my office and, and cry and cry. We live in Ontario. One of in Canada, we know Medicare. Medicare is where care is based on your needs, not on your ability to pay. Why is it that we all know, and you can speak to this way better than I can, that you cannot have health without good mental health? Uh, they, are, they are linked. 
None of us will be healthy if our mental health is not healthy. But yet, our mental health system is fragmented, hasn't seen a base budget increase in about 12 years now, and we all know that the needs keeps going up and up. You know better than I that there is still a lot of stigma surrounding mental illness, surrounding mental health, but it is changing. It is changing because of good people like you who comes to Queen's Park and organize a mental health chart. I cannot tell you how proud I am <laughs> that you're doing this. Uh, it will be really good for, for all of MPP, all of my colleagues uh, to, to listen in and to take part. Uh, I've been at this job long enough to know that the good speeches are the short one. So <laughs> th thank, thank you for coming. If I can be helpful, if I can be useful, it will be an honor for me to help. Again, uh, you speak from a place of power. You know what mental health looks like. You know what mental health needs looks like. And you know what mental health supports looks like. Make sure that you speak to as many MPP as possible so that we also learn from you. Merci d'être ici ce matin. Thank you for coming. Jimmy Wetch. Bonjour à tous. Uh, good morning. And uh, so great to be with you, Carrie Ann. Thank you for, for doing this. Really uh, an honor. And your worship, uh, your also worship, uh, your wife, uh, Karen. Um, you know, uh, I just got off the uh, doing an interview with uh, 1010 John Moore about the New Deal with Toronto, and uh, I have a feeling I'm going to leave right after because Kevin's going to run after me wanting a New Deal for Pickering. <laughs> I know how he is, so uh, so I'm going to I'm going to, uh, but I do have to go after. But Karen, uh, terrific for you to host us today, and you know, mental health and addiction has touched it touches everybody. I don't care who you are. It touches our families. It touches our brothers, our sisters, our parents, everybody. Um, and Kevin and Karen lost a loved one. It's difficult. Karen, you talked about the challenges you've gone through your family. It touches all of us, and we have an obligation. We've had physical health care for a long time, but we now have to up our game in mental health and addiction care, without question. It's okay not to be okay. We have to have the supports in place to help those who need our help. That's how you judge a society. How do we help the most vulnerable in society? Yesterday, as part of the New Deal with Toronto, we put in a substantive amount of money for homelessness and shelter. $600 million over the next three years. 50% of the homelessness are right here in Toronto. And we provided a 40% increase in homelessness prevention program for all of Ontario. So municipalities right across Ontario who also are some suffering from homelessness uh, will have the supports. We're going to do more. We've got to do more. Um, thank you, Franz, for, uh, for her uh, remarks earlier. You know, this is not a partisan thing. This is a all-together thing. There's 124 of us in the legislature. There's no politics. There's no partisanship when it comes to mental health and addiction. There is none. Now, I've had the privilege as the Minister of Finance to increase the budget for mental health and addiction to historic amounts. Uh, and we continue to do that. We increased the community base rates by 5% in my budget last, last year, 5%. They hadn't seen an increase in significant period of time. And we felt for community human health resources on the front lines, they deserve our support. And we'll continue to do that. Um, but one thing I have learned as well is that we have to do it together. You know, many of the, uh, the structures and systems are fragmented. And, and uh, as Karen and others have said, you know, when you need help, it's not easy to navigate that help. It's still early days of trying to understand how we can help and how we can work together. Uh, I know many of you in this room who, um, who I've met, my colleagues, Lauren Coe and Patrice Barnes, I see you there, Jennifer French. We got the Durham crew here. That's great. Um, you know, God was here. Um, so, so you've got great representation in Durham, but and I Laurie Scott represents. And I saw Laurie Scott. Uh, where are you, Laurie Scott? Oh, Laurie Scott in the back, and John Yakubuski. Uh, you know, we've got uh, you've got great support in the legislature across all party lines. Uh, as Karen said, uh, reach out, uh, have those conversations, and this is not a one and done. This is not one and done. This is a journey that we have to take together, and it's hard work. It's hard work, but you know what? 
It's going to save lives. It's going to ha help people who need a hand. And the, I, I always say the measure of, of a society is how you help the most vulnerable in society. So every one of you in the room here today, we all play a role. We can't do it alone. Thank you, Carrie Ann, for bringing us together. Uh, special shout out to the mayor of uh, Pickering and, and the gala. And thank you for organizing an amazing gala a couple of weeks ago in Pickering. Oh, yeah. I was particularly impressed in your choice of DJs, right, Aleem and uh, Sean. I both worked in my constituency staff, by the way. Um, and they're great guys. And, you know, what a great cause. And thank you for your leadership and uh, bringing us all together. So many thanks. And I agree with France. The less you talk, the better. So I'll stop right there. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Now, mental health, we've heard, we've heard this morning that mental health is not addressed the same way as physical health is. And while we have come a long way in the last 10 to 15 years, if you look back 10 to 15 years ago, we are not where we were. We still have a long way to go. And stories like Alex's um, remind us how far we have to go still. Um, the need has never been more important for critical mental health supports provided by organizations and services that we all rely on. Um, mental health doesn't affect the person who has the challenges or the illnesses. Um, when a person dies by suicide, on average, on average, it impacts over a hundred people. And that's just one person. And as we see the statistics and the data and these numbers increasing, those people are also dealing with mental health challenges. So it continues to grow and grow and grow and build. So. It is now, you know, the time has never been more critical than now. And how we work together, you know, to make mental health care accessible for all, you know, we just heard about, you know, protecting marginalized groups and, and you know, the vulnerable. And how we do that is through partnership and through collaboration. What you have done here is beautiful collaborating with government officials and regional, local, national mental health organizations, um, medical professionals, um, and, and collaborating to, to make sure that those who need the services and, and the treatment can get it. So thank you all for being here. Um, you know, it's it's really great to see all of you here, and um, and this is the first of what I imagine will be many mental health events at Queens Park, hopefully. Um, and thank you, Mayor Ash and, and Karen, um, for for bringing this to Queens Park and and for doing the important work that you're doing. So thank you, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you very much for being here to discuss something that we don't often enough take the time to discuss, uh, mental health. Uh, my name is Adil Shamji. I have the honor of being the member of provincial parliament for Don Valley East, the Ontario Liberal Health Critic. Uh, by professional background, I'm a family and emergency doctor and challenges around mental health and addictions are largely one of the major reasons that I'm here in elected office. Um, working in the emergency department, you realize very quickly that though we don't talk very much about mental health or mental illness, it is very prevalent. And it does not discriminate. Though we do see disproportionately higher rates of mental health challenges and illness in certain populations, there's not a corner of the province, north, south, east, west, urban, rural, nor a demographic no ethnicity, no financial background, 
that is spared from the challenge of mental health and specifically mental illness. You see that in the emergency department. It underscores the importance of us being relentless in being kind, compassionate to each other, and in ensuring that we have mental health supports for everyone. One of the roles that I had, apart from being an emergency doctor, was to help operate 11 homeless shelters here in Toronto. And my job in that capacity was to bring primary care, mental health, and addiction supports to the most marginalized and vulnerable people in our communities. And on the one hand, it was a very, would be on the shadow of a doubt, it was a very difficult space to be in. But it was also one that was very inspiring. Because with the right supports in place, I saw time and time again, with my own eyes, not a friend of a friend, with my own eyes, I saw how addressing unmet mental health and addiction needs helped people reintegrate as productive, happy members in our society and, and in our communities. And it underscores the importance of having those supports in place. Now we saw during the pandemic, you know, though we've always had mental health challenges, we saw during the pandemic how rates of mood disorders, anxiety disorders, um, even eating disorders across all, uh, you know, mental health challenges across all demographics went up. And so I'm thrilled and proud to be here in this room today with individuals from all parties, people from all backgrounds, sharing with you a commitment to do everything that we can to expand mental health care, mental health access, and recognizing the fundamental role that mental health care has in our overall individual and community well-being. And so I thank you today and I join you in fighting for that better, healthier, more supported communities that we can so that we can ensure everyone with mental illness or who wants to find optimal mental health can get those supports in our community. Thank you very much. So when I was asked to speak, we talked about the topic. I could talk about a million things. I work in mental health. I have lived experience. I've done clinical work. It's a long list. But after some thought, it's a lived experience that I'm going to focus on today. Um, I lived with major depression and anxiety for about 20 years, so like two decades. I'm a, a little older than I look, <laughs> so it was about two decades. And, you know, I don't talk about this too much, but during that time, I had seen over 30 mental health professionals. And that's psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, even GPs, the list goes on. And I mention that because it wasn't that I was fickle or uh, a difficult case necessarily, it was just the system is horrible. There is no system, it's not connected at all. And it's really, you have to constantly fight and you have to constantly advocate for yourself. And I wanna make a few notes here. I, I'm very high functioning, I was very extremely lucky. I had a big support system, I had family who worked in healthcare and they kinda understood and were able to guide me. <clears throat> there were people that I could call when I was desperate and I had suicidal ideation. And with all of that, I still struggled immensely. And, you know, even more so as a black female to immigrant parents, it kind of added an, another layer of struggle. I, you know, right now I do think about the people who are unwell a lot. And I can't imagine the individuals who don't have any support and what they're going through, especially if they're racialized, um, because of the additional stigma as well as generational trauma. Um, I want to note here, you know, those two decades, all those professionals, it wasn't until the last like five years I was able to find and have a black psychotherapist. And it was a different experience. You know, she understood my culture, she understood the dynamics of my family, she understood the types of trauma. And the progress I made with her probably would have taken me five, ten years with someone else. So it's very important that we're investing in BIPOC <clears throat> resources and therapists and, and really making sure that that's addressed. 
a lot of people are going to fall through the cracks. We're in a very strange time. I find, you know, last year this time, people were still very, very, for lack of a better word, freaked out about mental health. I work with workplaces, I work with university and colleges. Everyone was still very, very distressed. And, you know, today, a year later, it's kind of fallen to the background. I don't know if you guys have noticed. It's, you know, I know with the economy and world events, it's difficult and people are very happy the pandemic's over, but the conversation's kind of stopped or it's been placed on the back burner. And as someone who lived for so long and went through so much and, you know, while the world was still turning, those people are still there, they're still struggling. And I think we haven't seen kind of the fallout of the pandemic yet and what that's gonna do. I think it's unfair for us to ask people who are struggling, you know, with the worst time of their lives, like, you need to get out of bed, you need to function because you need to find help. Finding help on your own is extremely difficult. Um, and I, I don't think people understand that added layer of, if I can't get out of bed, if I can't function, I can't scavenge for help. I don't even have that in me. Um, you know, it's, we're in a first world country, for back, lack of a better term, and it is a rich country as well. It, it shouldn't be this hard and this expensive to find mental health supports. Um, we need more funding, we need more resources, we need to pay attention to things like BIPOC issues. And we, I think we really need to think about a more connected system. I shouldn't be going to one social worker, doing a program with them, and then going to a psychiatrist, and she doesn't, she doesn't know what I did with the social worker. You know, how can we build on what the treatment ahead of, behind you? There needs to be some sort of connected system, and I don't think we think about that enough, because sometimes it starts, it feels like when you start with a new mental health professional, you're starting all over again, and you have to tell your story all over again. And I think there has to be a way that we can kind of um, change that process. Because even now when I talk to people, they they bring that up. They're like, I, I don't want to tell my story again. I don't want to go through that. Because it is painful to keep doing it and keep searching for that help. Um, in terms of the wait list, I know we mentioned it, but you know, for, for myself, if, if you had told me when I was 15, when I w first got extremely sick, if you had told me, you know, Stephanie, <laughs> you can't see anyone for three months or a year. I, I don't think I'd be here today if I had to wait that long. And I know it's something, it's extreme to say, but it, it's the truth. Um, and I think we just really need to think about, people don't have the time, they don't, they don't have those two months or that year to wait to find help. Um, so yeah, those are my main points. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I think wait lists are for things like Beyonce and Taylor Swift tickets and entertainment <laughs> and iPhones. It is not for mental health. <laughs> Thank you, Karian, uh, for doing this. I want to acknowledge my friend from Whitby, uh, former Councillor Newman. Deidre, good to see you. Uh, MPP French, uh, congratulations on your marriage. Uh, it's something you should only do a couple times in your life, so. <laughs> so congratulations, I haven't seen you since you've uh, uh, you made it legal, so that's good, congratulations. Uh, Nancy Henry, my dear friend from Ajax, thank you for sharing your story. Thank everybody for sharing their story. Uh, we tried to share our story about Alex today, and it, I'm so delighted that members of all three parties were here because as uh, the minister said, um, um, you know, mental health doesn't care what your politics is. They don't care how much money you make or what color your skin is. It's, it's simply, and thank you, doctor, for sharing your story about uh, uh, young people and the challenges because um, it, I can't even imagine, uh, you know, um, being a parent of, of a, a young, young child uh, dealing with those. And, and Nancy, you shared your story. So uh, thank you all for being here today. I encourage you, we still have some breakfast here if you uh, want uh, seconds or mic thirds. Um, uh, we do have some booths in the back from uh, uh, Ontario Shores and uh, Durham uh, Health, uh, Community Health. Um, please spend some time with them. 
because uh, it's important that we continue the dialogue. And uh, I appreciate everybody coming to the first Alex Monaghan mental health chats. I was really surprised when the MPP from Nickelbelt said that this hasn't happened before, which is remarkable because um, mental health should have a place in our seat of government. Uh, I've been in this building many times. My dad served in the 31st and 32nd and 33rd Parliament in this building, and I'll go see his name uh, upstairs uh, in, in, etched in uh, marble, which you'll have, Jennifer, as well. You already have, um, uh, which is quite an honor. You get to see uh, your name, in my case, my dad's name, uh, as, a, as, a, as a former uh, MPP. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, keep the conversation going. It's okay to be not okay. Thank you and God bless.